Hello, this is Access Rhode Island and its program Kids Count. My name is Elizabeth Burke Bryant, Executive Director of Rhode Island Kids Count, a children's policy and advocacy organization that works to improve the health, education, safety, and economic well being of Rhode Island's children. For today's program, we are very, very excited to have two guests with us that can help us dive into a very, very important issue and problem facing the country and facing Rhode Island's children and youth, and that is the problem of violence. Gun violence, gun deaths, young people involved with gangs, young people whose lives are cut short, both on the streets of Providence, in our other areas of the state, and across the country. So today, I'm very, very excited to introduce our guest to you. Tenny Gross is the director of the Institute for the Practice of Nonviolence. It's great to have you on the show. Thanks for having us. And I'm also thrilled to give a warm welcome to Lorena Garcia. And Lorena, you are uh, an AmeriCorps volunteer, and as I was joking before the show, but I really don't mean it as a joke, <laughs> you're very fortunate to be working with Tenny Gross and in the Institute. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you agree. Oh, definitely. And you are an AmeriCorps volunteer that is stationed at Central Falls High School, is that right? Mm -hmm. Well, we are really thrilled to have you on the program. It is such a, a very sad time in our country, a very horrifying time. Um, I've been working on behalf of Rhode Island Kids Count with the Institute for many years. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what is really out there in the public eye right now, Tenny, has been on your mind, I know, and my mind for many, many years. Um, it always is good, I think, to be able to have you on the program to hear about the Institute, as well as to really take a, a real hard look at what's happening here in Rhode Island in terms of gun violence, mm -hmm. and particularly in the aftermath of the, the terrible horrifying events at Newtown, Connecticut. Um, but I know that you're tracking these statistics every day on the streets of Providence. So for viewers who don't know about the Institute, Tenny, why don't we start with you. What is the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence? So the Institute was founded in 2000 uh, by the Tim Ministry at St. Michael's Church. And really it was to try and focus on both youth violence through the tools of nonviolence, King Yen nonviolence, teaching it. Uh, but also Sister Anne and Father Ray, Sister Anne is in this issue of Rhode Island Monthly, great profile of her. The idea that our elites actually need to be trained in nonviolence. We need to build a system that is just. Uh, nonviolence tries to change behaviors, cultures. It's something both conservative and liberals can agree on, by the way, uh, because we don't need to change mindsets of people. Uh, so that's our core program, and we do that in Central Falls, in other three schools in Providence, etc. We also have the street workers program. These are many of them former gang members, not all of them, who go out on the streets. They respond to the hospital for shootings and stabbing, and they work on conflict. So that's kind of the immediate let's work and mediate situation. We have an adult reentry program. At the moment, a juvenile reentry program is suspended because of funding. Uh, we have employment program. Again, it's very important to teach people nonviolence, but at the same time, they need real opportunities for employment. And we have a consortium of employers now that are working with us, like Gilbain and others, to really try and make it an inroads into giving second chances opportunities for people that cost us as a taxpayers quite a bit. So those are some of the core programs. And, and then we added uh, five years ago, four years ago, the tr victim services. And that's a critical program. And we, under one roof, we work with offenders and victims. And that brings a lot of healing. Uh, if anyone saw Sunday, uh, there was an editorial, uh, actually a piece in the New York Times magazine on forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, a mm -hmm. guy killed his girlfriend and how the two families came together in a restorative justice process. Mm -hmm. It's very important that we think there's limits to our justice system. Mm -hmm. And it's really at the end of the day, we've got to build a beloved community. It's not a pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. Well, that's interesting that you say that. I remember the very earliest days of the Institute and you teaming up with Sister Anne. And as you say, the profile on her, which I think is called Sister Act, which yes. really goes down to the roots of Sister Anne's ministry and how you teamed up together to form the Institute. Was it based on some just shocking, horrifying things that were happening on the streets of Providence at that time? Some of it was that they were burying people, young people, particularly at St. Michael's Church. Part of it is just really, you cannot wake to some great theory. You've got to act. Sister Anne, like the sister act, is the, 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 the thing is you act. The same thing we felt uh, in the 90s in Boston when we had 152 homicides and we brought it down to 31. 
really on one level you don't need super professionals you just need to care about your neighbor and mm -hmm. your fellow human being uh, and you go and you put some work into it those you know well in a way we're like on the streets of the emergency room there's conflicts out there you go and you teach certain tools which is nonviolence. and Lorena speaks so well of actually when you train what does it do? People don't think of those alternatives too often. Well, before we turn to Lorena, who I'm very excited to hear more from, your experience day to day, using and doing this training and being in a place, Central Falls, where there are young people that are looking for answers and you're helping them work through it. So, Tani, I remember in the earlier days, and I, I think it's still true, you have uh, a train-the-trainer model where you use uh, Dr. Martin Luther King's beloved community model of actually teaching nonviolence as a thing you teach and practice right. and is it still true that you um, have trained the trainers volunteer or staff trainers that go out into communities and say um, come to our trainings see how there's a different approach to dealing with conflict absolutely we had the former US attorneys take it together with people who spend time for murder uh, victims mothers who lost their loved ones to violence all come together because they want to make a difference mm -hmm. uh, and that's what it is we're not looking for super professionals we're looking for people which is really all of us, but they're waking up and they want to be trained in the tools of nonviolence. It's sort of hard sometimes to sell it until it affects you. Mm -hmm. Many people who come to the train says it affected me. I ended up in jail for 12 years for something I've done. Or a mother or a brother, I lost my brother to violence. Uh, but people, when they start that, it creates a bond. People remember which year they took the training together. We just finished one. And it creates a real bond of, uh, it changes your life. You know, I'm a former ser sergeant in the Israeli army. Uh, I know things through the terms of nonviolence. It is much easier to destroy than it is to build. Uh, the beauty of nonviolence, it takes away some innocence from you as well. Because now you cannot ignore things that are happening down the streets or on the other side of the highway. Mm -hmm. It is all our community and we're all commanded to do something about it. And do you think it's making a difference? I know it's making a difference. How know? do you know that? So we had last year 17 homicides in Providence. Three of them were gang or group related. You know, 17 is not a great number. Uh, we, it's less than when Sister Anne started on the institute. Uh, we had a horrific stretch of 10 or 12 weeks. It's just unexplained and unrelated shootings and a three months old baby killed by a stepdad and things like that. But what, in Chicago, for example, last year we had more than 500 homicides. 80% are driven by gang or youth or mm -hmm. crews. It's a very big difference, mm -hmm. right? When we started the Institute on Hanover Street, every night there were shots fired, every night. There were four different gangs on that one street in the West End. That is no longer the case. We are not taking the whole credit, by the way. Oh, of course you don't. Right. Right. Police has a huge uh, part of it. But you cannot, at the end of the day, a lot of police chiefs around the country will tell you, we cannot arrest our way out of it. There needs to be a way for regular people from the community to be involved. And the Institute has spun that, has led that. Other people have since been trained, left us, they're doing their own initiative. At the end of the day, we as a community got to solve it. You know, it is the primary thing. When people commission studies, big foundations, university, what is the number one issue for people in the community? Always one issue comes to the top. Which is? Violence. Mm -hmm. As a mother, as a father, you want your kid... To be safe. To be safe. Then we can think about studies and college and successful job and marrying the right person and all those nice things. But without safety, you got nothing. Mm -hmm. What doesn't happen following those uh, research often is we do not fund it also as a priority. But that's mm -hmm. a whole nother matter. But safety is the biggest thing. We talk with mothers and fathers all the time and brothers. They fear not sleeping at night, thinking someone will be taken from me. Uh, that's something that has to be addressed. And we now know we have reached people that we consider completely incorrigible. And we're costing the taxpayer. If you are in high security, According to the Department of Correction, you cost us, the taxpayers, $200,000 a year. Mm -hmm. A bullet to the stomach is about $300,000, you know, in a certain stay in a hospital. Who pays for all this uncompensated care? Mm -hmm. You and I do. Mm -hmm. So we know now we have taken people who were costing us a fortune, they were troublemaking, and are now productive, successful, paying taxes, supporting their children. That's another thing that happened with high rates of incarceration. We have about 800 to 850 parents from the Providence school system who are in jail. 
-hmm. They're not there to parent. Mm -hmm. This is costing us generation after generation. So we now know how many conflicts we have disbanded, how many gangs issues we have broken apart, how many gang members that were really caught in a deadly dead end are not doing it. Not to mention the trainings in the schools where many kids now won't go to gangs and won't join that. So that's paying forward. Mm -hmm. It's going to pay us forward forever. Well, that, that's really, really exciting to hear that. And mm -hmm. there's always the, the nightly news about the tragedy that happens. And I know it's harder to tell the story about the tragedies that don't happen, right. the tragedies that are prevented. Right. So Lorraine, Let me jump on oh, that go, sure. It's really important to articulate that, which I don't often articulate well. We do not say, let's disband medicine because Rhode Island Hospital is the fifth busiest emergency room in the country. We mm -hmm. don't say, you know, they're failing. People are still showing up at the emergency room. We try and improve the treatment. Right. People are going to get sick. People are going to get in conflicts. It is how do we resolve that? Are people living longer? Are there less people involved in gangs? All those things. And sometimes I worry with violence. People say, well, look, on the news we still have shootings, but they don't see it's a different kind of shootings now. We still haven't dealt with the issue of guns. That's a whole other issue. We're finally now, this administration in the city is very seriously dealing with gun uh, violence from clubs, mm -hmm. which was a category Providence was exceptional at, and it's going down. So we need to educate the public. There's really things you do, like in medicine. You know, cancer, yes, it kills people. But we didn't give up after five years of research. We're now into 50 years of research on cancer. And we're making progress, the same with violence. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, that's a really good way to now shift to Lorena, your great work. First of all, what made you want to sign up for AmeriCorps? Um, so I, I just graduated from Brown. and. Um, I decided, you know, to take some time off before going to med school, and and I really wanted to give back to the community. I, you know, growing up was surrounded by a lot of gang violence, and I'm from Texas, and so I, I kind of always had those experiences that I brought with me, and um, you know, I decided I really, before even trying to become a doctor, I really need to understand what is what are the real issues that are facing people in the community, and. Um, and I've really adopted Providence as my community, so I really wanted to be able to find a way to give back. And AmeriCorps is a great way to, you know, enlist yourself in service. Um, and then from there, I heard about the institute, and I was just drawn. I just really wanted the opportunity to work there, and I applied, and um, you know, made sure that I went down. I didn't hear back about a time for an interview, and I got on a bus and came down anyways. And um, so great. it was it was great. And then, as you said before, you know, I, I sort of won the lottery, so to speak, in getting to work there. And now I'm sitting here next to Tenny, and so that's been a great, great experience. Well, first of all, we're really glad you're involved in the community and that you feel like Rhode Island and Providence is your home. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're now in Central Falls, which is great. Mm -hmm. So um, let us know about a typical day when you're at Central Falls High School. Um, I think that um, we owe a lot to Fran Gallo, the superintendent, to really be thinking about how do we keep kids in school, how do we keep kids um, following their dreams as opposed to the exact opposite of that. And there's been a lot of leadership efforts by the teachers at Central Falls um, that are really paying off. So how does that role for you work in a high school like Central Falls? Um, so on a on a regular day, uh, my partner Garrett Locke and I will normally get there. We're in the principal's office, the assistant principal's office, by around eight. Meaning your fellow AmeriCorps member. That you're, there's two of you assigned. There's two there. of us. So okay. um, me and my partner will go down. We'll we'll uh, have a meeting with the assistant principal at eight. By then, we know if there's any kids that are going to be in suspension that day. Uh, if they are, we start at about 8.30, we'll walk down with them to Progreso Latino, which is a nonprofit that's about two blocks down. And um, we have uh, basically from 8.30 until 12 um, to do nonviolence training with them. And a lot of what we do there is sort of sit down and think, you know, why are you here? Why, why did you get sent, um, you know, to suspension? So instead of just sending you home for the day and leaving you and having, you know, that was the end of the conflict, we really want to try and bring them in to say, you know, what happened? What was the issue? Like, what was, what were you feeling? Um, we worked through things like triggers, like what, what was the thing that set you off? You know, there had to be, you know, something and sort of talking about why is it important to know, to know that, what, um, what about your reactions? Why is 
that why is that something that's important to know about? Um, and then from there, we'll talk about you know what are goals that you have. How how does you know getting in trouble or doing certain actions affect you negatively? Um, and then we kind of work from there and you know go into a different nonviolent stuff. We talk about dealing with conflict. Um, and I th I think that's the most surprising thing is you know we have kids and we spend you know the majority of our time pretty much saying you're not a bad kid. Um, you're just a kid who made a bad choice. And I think that that's you know, really important. It's, it's interesting how often it seems that they don't hear it that often. I, I think that a lot of emphasis, especially with kids that you tend to see getting sent, you know, the suspension is usually either you did something right then that was really bad, or over time it's kind of you know, habitually been happening. And so there really is a mindset saying, like, well, everyone's just looking at me like a bad kid. Um, and this is really a chance for us to say, no, you're not a bad kid. You just made a bad choice. So how can we fix this? And how can we think about it? And most of the time, it just doesn't, it doesn't occur to them that there was another way to have dealt with the conflict. It really is um, surprising sometimes that it, that was sort of a one-track mind. It's like, I got into an argument. Something wasn't going my way. Or somebody made me feel uncomfortable. Someone made me feel scared. Someone upset me. I was already a you know, mad about something else, and I was carrying all this, you know, tension, all this emotion, and then something set me off, and um, you know, it was easy to just, you know, do this, and and they never looked back, and there was never any, you know, other option. I think in that way we're really failing. Um, you know, kids, we we don't teach them that there there are so many other ways to react to a situation, and I I think alternative suspension, at least for now, is giving us the opportunity to pull them in and get to do that. Um, aside from that, um, we teach two nonviolence courses with two different groups, so Guide to Success and uh, Score Mile, which are two groups that are really aimed at uh, bringing in students that might otherwise not sort of be brought in. So kids, Score Mile is aimed at uh, kids that are, tend to be having a little bit more issues adjusting or having more behavior um, and puts them into an environment that they can be more supported in. And Guide to Success is really for students who would otherwise be um, over age and under credit to so say, don't drop out. Um, we will work with you still. And that uh, program enrolls a lot of teen mothers, especially, which is uh, a big issue in Central Falls. Um, so they're really great programs that are really trying to figure out how do we support students, um, how do we teach them, and the nonviolence fits perfectly in there because it's it's sort of the component that's missing. Mm -hmm. And are you finding that as you work with individual young people and get to know them, um, that the idea that they have to be a positive part of their school community, it matters, you know, how they are engaging or not, um, so that other young people can learn in an environment where. Everybody has to be in it together. Mm -hmm. I think that that's definitely what comes out of it, and so much of it is there. There's no time. There's too many. You know, you have too many uh, students in a classroom. It's hard for teachers who are already being sort of overworked. They're trying to teach a lesson and manage a class of 30 kids who are, you know, for whatever reason, everyone's bringing in, you know, their own story, and um, it can be really, really taxing and really difficult. And I, I think. You know, this kind of thing lets you brings you into a space where you can have a little bit of one-on-one -on -one, um, to really say, like, I am going to listen to your side of the story. I'm going to get to know you, um, and then you know, really find out how do you appeal to to students. You know, what interests them, what's important to them, and then say, you know, well, this is how it's affecting you. Now we can now that we've built this trust, we've built this relationship. You see how it's affecting you. Now let's think, how is it affecting the, your teacher? You know, when you when you got into this, or when you said that to her, or you know, how was it affecting the other kids in the class? You know, now the lesson stopped. Your teacher had to, you know, worry about trying to deal with you. So how do you, you know, bring the focus back in and you know, see? So it's affecting you, which isn't a win, and it's affecting everyone else. Um, so really, you know, the way to do it is to say, I have to be, you know, a better leader. Um, because also people are going to follow me. The majority of kids, you know, we we think, oh, these these are bad kids as we label them, and you know, we put them. Those are really a lot of the time. Those are the best leaders because they're probably in there because a lot of kids are following them, mm -hmm. um, and it's really influencing the behavior of you know their peers. And sometimes it's the first time that anyone's told them that you know to say, you know, people really follow you. 
you know, that thing you did, it, it seems like sometimes, you know, you end up in trouble and then your friends end up in trouble. So if you change your behavior, you know, do you think it's, it'll maybe have an effect? And a lot of students will come in sometimes and they'll say, you know, I really want to change my behavior. I want to find something that motivates me so I can, you know, do better. It's, it's not even that, you know, kids don't want to and they're stubborn and, um, you know, they really want to, they just don't have as much guidance. They don't even know where to turn to or what to do. And, and nothing like, um, you know, teaching nonviolence is sort of giving them those tools to say, this is how you function in a community. This is why it's important. And also, you know, this is how you deal with conflict. And conflict is healthy. It's good to have tension. You know, that's what we want to encourage. But these are the ways that you can, you know, sort of deal with it in a way that makes it positive for everyone. And manage it and turn it around and mm -hmm. lead in a different way. Well, it sounds like you have a great role to play and are you getting support from the administrators and the teachers as they see you, you do what you do? Mm -hmm. um, we, we get a lot of support. I think I'm, I feel very fortunate and I think my part partner feels the same way. We, we, we leave sometimes and we talk, oh, you know, that was really great. I, the, the day went well or it was a really rough day. Um, but we have people who are checking in on us. We work closely with administrators. Um, we like will stop in even, you know, from anyone from the attendance clerk who's really great and she'll usually will stop in and will say, you know, was there any was there any students? And she usually has ideas, um, you know, you, you should really like talk to this student or I see them or, you know, she, she can hear in the halls and um, you know, she has a, a really quick eye and she's definitely always ready to give us, you know, advice or support or, you know, lent ideas. And I think that that's the best part is that really everyone in the school has something that they can tell us, um, you know, from the counselors to the attendance clerk, the teachers um, and the administrators to tell us this is this is what's going on in the school. So we we kind of are unique in our position and that we get to sort of see the bigger picture a lot of the times because we kind of get to you know roam the halls and sort of talk to students and talk to teachers and kind of get to sort of throughout the day see you know this is what happened this day at school it's really nice well you know thank you for all you're doing there it sounds like you're really making a difference and what a great way to inform yourself before you go to medical school yeah. um, I remember Marion Wright Edelman addressed the Brown graduates of medical school at their commencement and she and I had a conversation and she said you know I think I should be speaking to the freshman medical students not the seniors <laughs> to really help them understand what advocates they can be mm. so you know I I just really want to say, you know, thank you for what you're doing to really make thank sure you. that some of these young people really get on a better path. And that's mm -hmm. hard work, and you're doing it every day. So. Thank you. And um, back to you, Tenny. I think we'd like to round out the program, which is rapidly coming to a close, about the issue of guns. I know that Marion Red Edelman on the Children's Defense Fund website has really put up the shocking statistic that 2,600 mm -hmm. children and, and young people have killed, been killed by guns just in 2010, um, and that about 1,700 of those were homicides. You know that that would equal, if those children were still alive, about mm -hmm. 108 classrooms of 25 students each. Mm -hmm. So as we mourn the horrendous, horrendous Newtown situation and those, those, the tragic killing of those young children and their teachers, um, we also look to the streets and of Providence and other urban communities and know that the, the statistics are horrifying there as well. So are there any words that you want to say about that? I mean, we have no excuse to continue the way we are as a society. I mean, there's a Second Amendment, which I have an interpretation of, uh, and others have their own, and there's going to be, I'm sure, some struggles. It's going to be a process. I think you start with those assault rifles, you know. I was reading at PBN today, at, you know, the business news, Providence business news, how guns are flying off the shelves in Rhode Island. And I didn't know we have 11 manufacturers of weapons in Rhode Island, mm -hmm. but we do. So it's going to be one issue. It's not going to address, so I'm concerned, I'm actually in Washington tomorrow. I am concerned uh, with the Biden Commission, we're going to look at basically what's killing the suburbs, the mm -hmm. occasional freak AR-15, uh, and maybe the lack of mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, what we need in the city is really handguns are killing the inner city. And what we need is we can't wait for a psychiatrist to give a pill to an inner city kid. Mm -hmm. you know? We need the conversations like Lorena is having in the schools day in, day out. Uh, inner city kids 
They need a place, an outlet, a stress, an environment that are stressful. And even actually Newtown would have helped if there were more than, we couldn't just wait for a psychiatrist. Psychiatrists actually today don't talk to anyone anymore. Mm -hmm. They subscribe and move yeah. on. So we got to make sure we approach this in the right complexity. So it's not all going to be about So it's that. multifaceted, it right? It is, but it is doable. It mm -hmm. not only is doable, it has to happen. Mm -hmm. We're an exceptional violent country. And, and as well with suicide, which is a point definitely to the availability of guns. We do need to make it less available. Other things that bother us, we could do recalls and we control how easy it is to access them. There's going to have to be some better, we've got to close loopholes. There's some simple stuff that uh, have to happen. The Commissioner Perry speaks about that. But we need to start invade, inve investing seriously in behaviors. And not just punitive behavior, but working on relationships. How do you respond to things? Uh, will have to happen. We know the way. We know what works in reducing violence around the country. We and our partners around the country know what to do. It. It's research, etc. It's relationship. It's involving people who knew those gangs. It's giving opportunities. It's making sure everyone is touching somebody. And then I know um, I know that we have we have the national statistics here in Rhode Island. We track this with a lot of people's help, and we were reporting that between 2006 and 2010, there were 62 gun-related hospitalizations of youth ages 15 to 19, and 22 deaths. And that's probably an undercount, as you say, because of the other sort of uh, gang-related incidents that may not make it in the, into these statistics. But still, when you think about 62 gun-related right. hospitalizations of youth, people can't say, oh, it's happening somewhere else. Right. And you know, when it's a 21-year-old who's getting shot, that's not in the statistic. They're, they have a younger brother or sister. Yeah. They have a parent. It happens on the street where loads of kids live. That many of us will not want to live on streets like that. That they're exposed to an environment that is a warlike environment. Mm -hmm. You are traumatized. You don't trust people. So it's not just the person of being shot. The effects of ripple effects on whole communities that are held hostage in the richest country in the world. Mm -hmm. And so as we move ahead, I think um, having the numbers out there, the strategies, thinking about it holistically, uh, the preventing gun violence and access to true mental health. We know that one in five young people has a diagnosable mental mm -hmm. um, issue. Yeah. And so many youth in this country, including Rhode Island, are not getting the access to mental health. And then the proactive strategies. I really salute the work that you do to have jobs for young people. If we could spend um, just a couple of seconds on that, and then I have to wrap up. Why sure. is a job so important in the well, summer? I was meeting today with Amica Insurance, and I said, you know, they make risk assessment. I said to them, wow, that's great. Will you lend me some of your expert? Imagine if we did a risk assessment to someone who is coming out of the ACI. Yes. Right? They have a pattern, they have a behavior, just like if you're going to give them an insurance policy. Yeah. Imagine now if you give them a job that costs a year about $30,000. Mm -hmm. And imagine that prevents them from going back for $200,000. That's a saving right there of 170000 And imagine, if I can interrupt because we're winding down, if we can have young people have a good use of their time mm -hmm. and not go to the ACI in the first place. Absolutely. So I can't believe the time has so quickly passed. I want to salute the Institute for the Study and Practice of Nonviolence. Thank you for And you, that. Tenny Gross, and you, Lorena Garcia, thank you for being on the program. And I want to thank our viewers for tuning into Access Rhode Island. Please join us for another program. Thank you for being with us.